Gwinnett Woodworkers are filming here in Rob's shop today where our normal videos are done in, in a Peachtree Woodworking classroom on Saturday morning with our live audience and oftentimes the camera work and the background noise is not really conducive to YouTube videos so we're doing some video sessions here in Rob's shop uh, with a little bit more controlled environment. Okay, in one of our previous sessions I touched on some basic lathe tools and, and, uh, and or orientation stuff of the lathe. Uh, today we're going to cover specifically spindle turning things. Uh, so I was going to start out with some different the different fixtures that are used for spindle turning. If you can zoom in here, Bob, we got got some different examples of different types of drive centers. The, this type of four prong drive center that comes with the lathe. Oftentimes when you're when you're pounding that in, if you're if you're more so on if you're doing. Uh, bowl type turning or cross grain turning when you go to put that spur drive in two of the things are going to be try to be with the grain and two will be go across the grain and sometimes it's hard to get that driven in what some people do is they'll take that spur and they'll grind off two of the points two of the posing uh, points uh, and, and leave, leaving just uh, points directly across from each other uh, to make contact with the wood. So that oftentimes you'll see mod people modifying the poor four prong spur like that to turn it into a two, two prong spur. This, this is the dry, typical dry spur that comes with, a, with the, the lathe, you know, four prong spur. Um, this, is, this is a Sorby uh, stab center. And then this is a, a, a Chinese knockoff of, of the, it's the same sort of thing, but you can tell that the, uh, the, 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 the points are just not ground the same. The, the Sorby Steb Center is far superior, in, and that's the one that I like using. But those are different drive centers with the, with the taper that goes in, in, the, uh, in the spindle. Then on the other end, on the tailstock, then we have different types of, of centers that goes in the tailstock. Years ago, we had what was called, I guess it was just called a, a tailstock center, or I guess a dead center, but it didn't turn, and you'd, you'd put beeswax in here for lubrication. Nowadays, though, you can use this on the, on the, on the dry spur. If you're, you want to do stuff with the skew, I'll show you later, and you're concerned about getting a catch, you can actually use this as a drive center on, on, the, uh, on the spindle. But there's, here's some different uh, types of live centers now. With the advent, I've, you know, the past, I don't know how many years it's been since they started using live centers, but this, this is the, the, the typical live center that will come with a mini lathe. And then this, this is a live center that comes with, sometimes comes with the, with the larger, the jet lays. It's a, a one-way type of live center, and that, and that comes with the, the jet 1642 lathe. And then here's, and, and this one has, is threaded here for, you can put different types of fixtures on it as threaded. You can put a fixtures like that and different things on it for, uh, for holding stuff. Um, this is another live center that has a magnet in it that you can easily put different types of points in it. Uh, this, this is a, a live center that's made specifically for pen turners. It's a quarter inch hole here to go on the, uh, to support the end of the pen mandrel. And I'll show using that for other uh, uh, uses here today. And then again, then we, the, the Sorby, this is a live center, this is a Sorby live center, has the same, same kind of teeth on it uh, with a, uh, a spring-loaded point uh, for, for a live center. For, for spindle turning, uh, the, the, you, the piece is mounted on the lathe with the grain running lengthwise with the bed of the lathe, where on, we took, the other option is bowl turning, where you have a larger piece of wood, of course, and the grain is mounted so it's crossed this way. And that's typically called face plate, face plate or bowl turning. What we're going to be doing today is, is spindle turning where the grain is running in line with the bed of the lathe. So the first thing you need to do is, is mount your piece of wood on the lathe. And the first thing I do is I'll, you know, the center finder. 
I'll just mark mark the center of the wood. And if, if your piece is perfectly square, you just need to go around from, from two opposing corners. But if it's not perfectly square, it won't be the same. So I go around from each corner and mark it. And it, it, uh, then, then I'll pick the, uh, the, the point that's in the center of, of those four marks. So there I've got the, uh, the marks on there. And then I'll take a, uh, an awl or a center punch and just, just, make a, just mark that center to make it easier to find the center when I put it on the... Uh, on the on the lathe. Okay. Now again, if you if you're using this four prong type spur, if you're using this type of spur, you're going to need to because it, it's it's not going to seat in there just but from pressure. You'll need to take a, a dead blow hammer and, and pound it in to 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 seat it good in the wood. But with these these the stab centers that I'm using, you don't need to do that. It will uh, the teeth are sharp and it'll it'll uh, it'll bed themselves without. Uh, well, without any, uh, without having to drive it in. And that's mounting the, uh, the wood in there. So the, the uh, there's, there's different types of tool rests. This is the type of tool rest that come, typically comes with a lathe. And it's, a, I don't know if it's, it's you know, cast iron or what kind of steel it is, but it, it's, it's not a hardened steel. And you will get, get uh, nicks in the tool rest here, and you need to continually dress that with a file to, uh, to get rid of the nicks. Uh, this, this tool rest here is, a, is made by Robust. And this has a hardened steel strip across the top here that will not nick. And that, that's a tool rest that I prefer using. And that's what we'll be using today. And one other thing, when I first started turning, I was always concerned about, well, how, how high do you set the tool rest? Well, it depends on what you're doing uh, you know, and the tool that you're using. Uh, we, to, first thing you need to do is make that round. And there's, there's different tools that you use to do that. First, the most common, you know, we have a spindle roughing gouge, and it typically is ground with about a 45 degree uh, bevel angle. That's, that's the angle. When I'm talking about the bevel angle, it's the angle from, from the inside of the flute down the face. There we go. From the inside of the flute down the face of the bevel is 40, about 45 degrees. Uh, the spindle roughing gouge is ground with the wings. The, sweat, the wings are not swept back; they're straight across. So you can use you can use the tool at any any part of that bevel. Another tool that can be used is I think it's referred to as a continental gouge. It's not quite as a as, it's a, a shallower flute. And on this one, I've got the wings swept back just slightly, but still I've got about a 45 degree bevel nose down the nose. And then of course, then you can also use the skew. For, for doing the roughing is with the skew. And I'll, I'll give you, show you an example of doing it with all, all three of these tools. Okay, safety wise, you always want to wear face protection. Um, we'll, we'll test this today. If, if I may have to use these glasses depending on how the microphone picks up, but I always, always use a full face shield when I'm turning. Uh, if you're doing noise and stuff, you want to protect your ears. And if you're working with woods particularly dusty, um, the, the domestic woods, uh, you want to use uh, the dust protection. Okay, so, so when I'm doing the roughing now, first, when you first put the wood on there, you always want to turn it by hand to make sure that it's not going to hit the tool rest. And I want to, you, you talk ABC, you want the tool anchored on the tool rest and then the bevel rubbing, and then you raise the handle until it starts cutting. Mm -hmm. I want to adjust the tool rest so that I can, I can hit the, the, the tool on the, be, on the tool rest, anchor it, and then with the bevel rubbing, and then I'll bring the cut down. I may need to lower that down just a little bit more. And of course, we'll try that. And to start out with, I'll, when it's still, still in this sort of state, I'll, I'll limit the RPM to about 1,000. Okay, so again, I put the tool on the tool rest, get the bevel rubbing, and then I raise the handle until the, the cutting edge 
And, and just to get to, to get the, the to knock the points off, I can just go like this, making sort of like a peeling cut. And you got the corners knocked off there a bit, and you can see it, it gives you a fairly rough cut like that. You can also use this more of a bevel rubbing type of cut. It giving you a sheer angle will give you a little bit cleaner a cut, but again, at this point, we're not really too concerned about a clean cut because we, we still got to get those corners knocked off. Let's bring the speed up a little bit higher. There's about 1,500. So now, I'm, instead of doing a straight peeling cut like this, I'm going to bring it around and, and make more of a shearing cut. And that should give us a little bit cleaner, so you can see it's much cleaner there as opposed to what we had with the, with the, with the peeling cut. You can see with the peeling cut, the, the, the peeling cut there got some torn fibers, but it's much cleaner there on the edge where I did the, uh, sh the, uh, the shearing bevel rubbing type of cut. Now we can do the same thing with this, this, uh, this the continental gouge. We can, we can do, do the same sort of thing. We could do the, we could do the, the, uh, the peeling cut like this, or we can tilt it over like this and give us a more of a shearing cut. And that, that gives us an even cleaner cut than what we had, say, get cleaner cut than what we got with the, uh, the, the spindle roughing gouge or the deep fluid one. And I wanted to show you one other thing with that. You can, we, I was using it like this. You can even, you can get more of a, uh, you can put it upside down and, and come in with it like that. When, when you're doing it, doing it a shearing cut like this, you're, the, the chips are coming into the flute. If you, you can bring it over like this, and the, and the chips will evacuate and get out of the flute and won't plug the food up. So you, you can, any, any way that you can present that cutting edge and, and give you a shearing type of cut, you'll get a clean cut with that. Okay, then we'll show doing the same sort of thing with the skew. And the skew should give us a much cleaner, cleaner cut, cleanest cut of all. So with the skew, I want to, again, anchor on, on the tool rest and bring the bevel up. And then we'll crank it up just a little bit faster. There's, there's about 1,800. So again, we put it on the tool rest. Now you don't, I see a lot of people do it. They get a death grip on it like this. Well, you just don't have a lot of control of it. You, you're, this is your control. And all I'm doing with this hand is just, just keeping it against the tool rest. And you see there, then that's, that's a much, much cleaner cut than what we were getting with the spindle gouge. So let's go ahead and just round this rest, rest of this off. The way you can tell if you, if you got it round, if you go across like that, you can tell you see it's very smooth. There's a bit of knocking there, so I've still got a flat, some, some flat spots there. Okay, there we got, don't have any knocking there, so that should be completely flat now. And then we got rid of all the corners. Okay, the, the, the different types of cuts that you can do on a spindle work, you have beads, V grooves, and coves. So a, a, a V groove with, with, the, uh, with the skew, you can make a v, v groove with the skew like this. Just raise the handle like a pump handle, and then you can come in from the, from the side and clean that out. And I'm using with the long point down. And the skew is, I've addressed the skew. The skew came with, you can see back up here where it was, it was flat with, with fairly sharp edges on, on the corners. But what I've done on, on, the, on the heel, the, the, 
this is the, the, the toe, which is the long point. The short point is the heel. And what I've done on the heel side of the skew is I've completely round, rounded that over so that when I, when I for, for assist in, in making beads, uh, it, it uh, can roll the skew. And then on, the, on the, the long point, I've rounded the corners just a bit so it doesn't catch. But still, when I want, when I want to make this, that, that being flat allows me to, uh, to better register it so it's going to be straight in. So, so we, can, we can make a V groove with the skew. And like I say, the initial, the initial cut is, with, is, just, is just like a pump handle action. So it's straight in like that. And then you can come back and, and, and bring it in from each side to, to make the, the, uh, the V groove deeper and wider. So that, that's with the VGU with a skew. Now we can do the VGU with a spindle gouge. Um, these, these are two different types of spindle gouges. Uh, the, the flute on this one is much shallower than the flute on this one. This is commonly referred to as a detail gouge. So I'm going to I'll use this one. We'll make, I've got fairly swept back wings on it. I've got about a 30 degree angle on the nose. So we can make our VGU with this and with, with the, with, when we're doing with the skew, let me step back on the skew again. I, I said that this, this is flat to, to help me register it straight up and down. If I try to go in with it, with it not registered like that and touch it, it's going to, you want to, want to go skate across like that. So you want the, the cutting edge needs to be completely vertical so that it doesn't try to skate sideways. So when I'm making the, the, the V groove with the spindle gouge, with the wings like that, I want to want to come in. I want to make the contact, the initial contact of the wood on that point, and that that point needs to be completely vertical. Where if it's if it's not vertical and you and you touch the wood, it's going to do the same sort of thing. It's going to want to skew across the wood like that. So I, I want to have the the point of the tool pointing directly toward the center rotation, and I want to touch it just on that. And if, I, if I'm not on the center rotation, even though I've got the point vertical, if I'm not on the center rotation, I'm going to be hitting down here on the wing and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to want to skate across the wood like that. So I want to, I want to have the, the point pointing directly toward the center and, and just make it the entry like that and then, then come back. And, and then once, once you get a little bit of a, a V there to where you got a little bit of bevel support, then I rotate it around to give me a little bit of cutting action down here on the lower wing. So once, once I get established, I'm come in. And then again, then, then when you get to the bottom, you need to go back to vertical. So you don't want to, if, if you, if you, if you're holding it to where you're cutting on the bottom edge, you get to the bottom, you're going to be scarring up the other side of the V. So once you get into the V, you need to rotate it back to where the cutting edge is, is completely vertical. So that's how you can make the V groove with the uh, with the spindle gouge. Let's go back to the skew. The, this this is the typical skew with a uh, with the the, the, the the skew angle is straight. Uh, the 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 skew is ground such that the thickness the, the length of the bevel here is about one and a half times the thickness of the tool steel, and that'll give you the proper angle or skew angle on the on on the uh, the bevel. So that's that's the typical. This is the basic skew with the uh, with the, the with the, the the skew angle is straight. There's no curvature on on the cutting edge, and it's it's hollow ground on on a, on a, on a wheel. With the roundness of the wheel, it's going to be hollow ground. So when you're riding the bevel, you're actually touching back here and on the nose when you're when you're actually you know touching on the bevel. One of the benefits of the hollow grind like this is that you don't need to go back to the grinding wheel to, to resharpen it. You can just touch it up on the diamond stone. You touch, touch the heel and then bring it up to where it's gone the point and then you can rub it back and forth. And, and if, you, if you, like that, then you can see a little bit of a shine, shine on the heel here and on the tip up here. So you, you, you can continually touch up the edge with the diamond stone until the bevel, until that hollow grind is gone, and then you'd have to take it back to the grinding wheel to reestablish that. Another way of, of, uh, of grinding the skew is not with a hollow grind, but with, with a convex grind. 
Oh, this is the grind I saw on, on Jimmy Clues's Back to Basics DVD. He, he likes this type of work, or, or in that DVD anyway, that's what the grind that he type used. So with this one, you, st you can still do that on, on, a, uh, on, a, on a, a stone, but instead of holding it in one spot, you, he, you just sort of stroke it on the wheel like that to give you that contact convex uh, contour like that. And one of, the, one of the benefits of this grind over this grind is on this grind here, you, you, you hear the term riding the bevel. Well, what you might run into is if, you, if you're putting too much pressure on that bevel, you're going to get, start getting a, establishing a washboard effect, where, and, the, and the washboard effect is going to be the width of, of the length from the point to here, and it, what happens if you're putting too much pressure on, that, on the heel or the back here on the bevel, it's going to start creating little uh, undulations in the surface of the wood, and the more you go and the more you press, the worse it gets, and you end up really with like a washboard effect. Well, with this skew, the, the contact patch with the bevel is much smaller. You don't, if, if you're touching back here, the, the, the cutting edge is not in touch. So you've got to bring it up to where you, you, you still got the bevel. You can still ride the bevel, but it's going to be a much narrower surface that you're riding. And if you have the problem with getting that washboard effect with the, reg, with the regular hollow grind, you can try this type of grind and, and you, you can much easier control and not eliminate, or you can eliminate that washboard effect that you get. So those skews are, both of these are ground with the, with this, with the cutting edge straight. Another one you'll still often see is this, uh, a, a grind that was, uh, I don't know who came out with, with first, whether it was Alan Lacer or Richard Raffin, but it's, it's cut, instead of being straight across, it's curved. So the cutting edge up the, the cutting edge up here is not as, as a severe an angle as what it is down here. So get, and, and you can do things like a peeling cut. You see, you watch uh, Alan Lacer's videos. He can go like this and just just you know peel it down and then bring it down to a, a round in, in very limited, very small amount of time, short amount of time. So that that's a a uh, Alan Lacer or Richard Raffin type of uh, rounded over uh, cutting edge. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll do some, uh, some, some beads and coves. I say the basic cuts. We start out with the V cut. But let, let's, let me go back and I'll get that cleaned up a little bit so we have a nice smooth surface to work with. And when, when you're coming in with the, it, it's not so much with the spindle gouge, but e even with the spindle gouge, you don't want to start here off of the, the, the piece because if, when you're coming in, if, it, if that edge catches, catches there, it could tear fibers out. But with the skew, you definitely don't want to do it with the skew because you don't have any way, anything for it to rub over. And to control. You don't have the bevel support to be able to control the cut. And that's the reason you need the bevel support is to be able to control that. If you, if you just put the cutting edge in there, you don't have any control of it at all. So you need, you need the bevel support to be able to control that cutting edge. And then you come back and do the last little bit going, going that direction, going off the end in that, going off the end in that direction. So let, let's uh, mark out some, uh, we'll do some beads. So we'll, well, this, this is going to be the side of the bead, side of the bead, that's the center, so this is going to be the center, and that's the center, so we'll make a, a bead cut here, establish the, the edge of the bead. Now we can round, with, 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 the, uh, with the skew, we can come down the trailing edge there and then just, just sort of round it off like that. Roll it, rolling the, the, uh, the tool around down into the into the low spot. Now, we, when we we want to uh, the the cutting edge or the bevel, the bevel on the cutting edge needs to point in the direction that you're of the of the surface that you're following. So to follow around to make that that uh, that curvature, you you have to bring the handle around to to turn keep that cutting edge tangent to 
the surface that you're cutting. Where if you, if you, if you don't move it around, your bead is going to have to be flat instead of, instead of, instead of a bead. You get, make some clearance on this side to get down in there. Rotate it around, bring the handle around, and follow down into it, connect the bead. Okay, so this, this should give you a better view of, of the, the cut I'm making. So I'm starting out up here at the center line, and I'm, I'm, I'm just basically using the heel of, the, of the, the cutting edge and then bringing the hand, swinging the handle around so I'm going to maintain. maintain that cut so that so that the bevel is tangent to the circ the curvature I want to cut. The problem you run into with the skew though is as, as you're rolling around and bringing the handle up, if if you bring the handle up too far and get off of the bevel, that's what happens there. You you, get, you don't you've lost control of the uh, of the cutting edge and it wants to skate back on you. So the problem you have with the skew is that you you need to control. The, the bevel so that you still got still got the bevel contact as you go around go around the surface of the bead. Where if you, if you bring it around too fast and lose that bevel support, it'll escape back on you. Now you can do the same thing with with the with the long point. You can you, I'm, I'm a, I've got a, about a 45 degree shear angle. I'm, I'm holding the skew so that my cutting edge is about 45 degrees to the to the uh, grain in the wood. And I bring it around like that. Well, the, the drawback to this is you, you don't have that good of visibility with that point on that short point. But if you bring it around this way and still maintain the 45 degrees, you've got a little bit better visibility of where the point is actually cutting at. And I didn't bring it around there. I didn't, I didn't raise it. If, if you, you've got to raise the handle and rotate it to follow the curvature that you're cutting. All the way down and like that. So that's with the skew. So I can do the same thing with the, with the spindle gouge. Just make the thing that out, make that, that deep, deep groove a little bit deeper there. Okay, with the spindle gouge, now I see some people come around like this and start it over here. And then, then you rotate again, you rotate around. Then when, once you get it started, if, if, you, if you maintain on the point all the way around, it, you don't have as very good cutting action, so you need to, once, once you get the bevel supported, then you need to come around here on the lower edge and, and do the cutting around there. Again, rotating the handle, and then when you get down toward the center, then you need to again, you bring the handle back up and rotate the tool so that the, the cutting edge is, is vertical to clean down inside in, in the bead. And again, you, if, you, if you try to go around, remaining on there, you're going to, it's going to come over and it's going to catch on the other edge. So you need to end up with, with that point completely vertical down inside the bead. Now that, that's, this, this, like I say, the angle on this point is, is about 35 or about 30 degrees. Uh, some spindle gouges are, are much more acute angle. I mean, uh, uh, much more uh, obtuse. This is about 45 degree. And you can do the same thing with this. It says you're going to have to move the handle around farther. And uh, so it's just, it's just a matter of preference. You can do the same thing with more of a conventional uh, spindle gouge. It's just that my, my clearance angle here, since this is for about 45 degrees, I can't get down into to a, a shallow or, or as tight a point in the bottom of the of the uh, of the bead or down the bead, I guess, down the bottom of the bead. Okay. So then, the other thing what you can do is is uh, is cos. Now you can't you you can do very shallow cos with this with a skew, but it, it's with a sh with the cove you really need to do to the spindle gouge works much better. So for making the cove, we're going to start out with, with the, the point completely vertical, and then we're going to do like a scooping action, just to scoop it out. And you only want to go down, if you, if you try to come all the way around the other side of the, the, of the, the cove, 
once you start coming up on the other side, you're going to be coming up underneath the fibers and tearing fibers out. So you need to start from this side, one side of the, of the toe going in like that, and then start from the other side and, and go down to the bottom. But it, it's, it's a scooping, scooping type of action. And you meet, go start from each, each side and meet in the bottom. Okay, well, one thing I didn't mention on, uh, on before, y'all, I, I was just going to make the whole, I actually just made a half of a bead. We'll, we'll continue on making make the other side of the bead. And you, you, everybody is, you, you, you work better on one, one direction or the other, it's more difficult. This way, th this is my preferred method. So going this way is just a bit more of a challenge because you're bringing your hand in toward your body. Now if you're completely ambidextrous, you could just switch hands. So after you've, after you've practiced going going down uh, making your beads, you know, if your piece of wood is, is large enough, you can just go back and clean it off and and, uh, and remove it, it, this, this, this piece of wood is, is actually kind of small to start with, so there's not, not much leeway there. But you can go back and you can just clean it off and start over again. And just keep going down until there's nothing left. And then one of, one of the, the benefits of doing this is if you want to make small stuff like finials. What happened there was I, I was sort of lost concentration, wasn't paying attention. I was my my diameter up here was larger than I was getting down here, and I was going along in that larger diameter, crept up on the on the uh, the long point, the long point dug in, and that's the typical catch that you see with the skew. So it, 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 what happened was I let it drop down and the, and the, the long point dug in and, and uh, that's what caused that. So I wanted to show you this other drive center that, that I briefly mentioned that it's called, it, it originally was designed as a, uh, as a center to go in the tailstock and again it was lubricated with beeswax but it, with the advent of, of, of the bearing driven live centers now we don't re don't really use those much anymore but this 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 can now be used as what's referred to as a safety center this is one particularly made by one way and i think if you look it's, it's called a safer center or safety center but we'll, what that will do it'll still give me drive force you have to put a little bit more pressure on it and and you typically have to uh, Drive, pound it in with to get to seed it with a hammer, but we'll, we'll just try it here now. So now, with that, if, if that catch would have occurred there now, we'll do go back and do it again. Purposely stick that point in there. It just stops it, and I don't get a severe catch. It just continues to spins over there. So that that's referred to as a safety center. And if you're just learning to use the skew, it, it's sometimes it's advisable to use that type of center. So if you do get a catch, it's not a big deal. So again, as well as I was talking about, is you, can, you can go and clean, you can clean it off, and then go back and do it again. You'll make more beads and coves and, and continue on. Um, but I find that a bit boring myself, as you make beads and coves, and it, it's good practice. But in the end result, you get it down to where you got nice looking beads and coves. You got a stick of wood that you have for a while, and it ends up being thrown away. So what I'm going to show you in the coming up in the next segments is something that you can make and if it all works out well it's got something that you can keep again this 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 is uh this two before uh junk you know pine scraps of two before wood or, or uh, construction lumber this is uh, made out of the same piece of wood this i want to show you in the next segments how you can make these and if it all works out you've got something you can keep and that's it for this segment thank you for watching